Good morning. This is Alana Mueller. I'm the president of Kaufman Fast Track, and welcome to our author series. It's my sincere pleasure to welcome this morning Lisa Gansky. Lisa is the author of the best-selling book, The Mesh, While the Future of Business is Sharing. She's also the chief instigator of Mesh Labs, the Instigator Collective, and the Global Share Economy Directory at www.meshing.it. Lisa's lens of choice these days is the share economy, or the hidden value in waste, business platforms, and evolving models for businesses, and the design of cities and communities. Lisa's specific passion and interest is in reducing our negative impact on our ecosystems through creative partnerships between companies, communities, and local governments to accelerate a shift, particularly in cities. Lisa is an impact junkie. Her tools are as an entrepreneur, architect, speaker, and writer. A founder and CEO of several internet companies, including GNN, the first web portal sold to AOL, and the largest consumer photo sharing and print service, Ophoto, Lisa's attention is on sustainable ventures with positive impact. Lisa currently serves as chief instigator of Mesh Labs, and she is a director and investor in several ventures, including GreenBiz, Honest Buildings, Loose Cubes, Pixel Pipe, Relay Rides, RidePal, Sidecar, Scoot Networks, Squidoo, and TaskRabbit. Please join me in welcoming Lisa Gansky. Hello, Alana. It's really great to meet you again, and, and hopefully soon I'll meet the rest of the folks uh, who are joining us this morning. So uh, to get started, let me just dive in and say that um, I've been an entrepreneur and hanging around this space for quite a long time, and one of the things that happened, um, and I guess happens fairly frequently, is I always feel that we come from a very generous culture and community um, as an entrepreneur, and around the valley in particular, I, well, at least that's my only experience, so I, I have a data point of one. But um, one evening I was having dinner with a friend who's um, an attorney, and uh, we were sharing our ideas about where things were going. This is in late 2007. And uh, not unusual to these sorts of meals. I'm sure many of you have had them as well. You start to riff a little bit about where you think things are going. And at some point, she leans in to me um, with this very serious face and says, OK, you know, I've asked you this every year for the last five years, whether you've noticed it or not. but." Uh, I want you to tell me, what do you think is the next big thing? And I said, well, you know, it's funny that you should ask because I've been kind of cooking something up, realizing that I, I, uh, I have an idea about what I think is going to be the next really big shaping thing for um, the economy, for communities. But I think it's really going to surprise you this time. She says, come on, you've, you've kind of thrown me off before. I said, no, no, really, this one's really weird. Um, I think that the next big thing is sharing. And I said, you know, sure. I mean, it's sharing isn't something that's new to us. It's not that it's actually the first time that we've ever experienced sharing. I mean, for God's sakes, we come from a culture that shares a lot. Things like bridges and roads, cafes in Brazil and other places, uh, spots for sharing. Public transportation, taxis, buses, trains, all sorts of public transit are spaces for sharing. A newer version of public transportation, bike sharing. Infrastructure like buildings, bridges, even cargo ships. In the background you can see uh, port cranes and fire, fire boats. All of those are meant to be shared. Really cool buses in Finland. All sharing starts and ends with what I refer to as the mother of all share platforms. And so sharing isn't new to us. So what's new about this? The mesh or the share economy is about better things easily shared. That's the design of better things. More thoughtful materials, timeless design, and things that are actually meant to be shared, designed to be shared, uh, flexible, connected to a system, and censored with an S so that um, they can be tracked when we know that they're near us and available. The mesh fundamentally is about a world in which access to goods, services, and talent triumphs over the ownership of them. Well, when I was thinking about this, like, so why is this happening now? There's a few things that are feeding this. 
Um, in 1900, 10% of the world lived in cities. It may have looked something like this. But in the last two years, there's been three really big studies that have predicted that in 2050, on average, they're guessing that, uh, or I guess a little better than guessing, that about 75% of the world's population, that's equivalent to every person on the planet today, will be living in a city by 2050. That might look something like this, or per, I'm sure very different in reality, but to get a sense of the magnitude, uh, we're looking at a world in which the density, the population density, is really causing us to rethink how we live. Um, we're going to be much more tightly packed into smaller spaces, and therefore it's a strong invitation for less stuff. Uh, contributing also is, of course, whether you call it the economic downturn, recession, new economy, uh, whatever it is that has caused us to kind of, in, for either ourselves as individuals or businesses, caused us to rethink the relationship between cost, true cost, and value. Uh, that is contributing. The whole uh, disillusion that we've had recently in the last, let's say, five years with big brands that have been around for, in some cases, hundreds of years and have really, um, brands were equivalent to tr building trust and now here we are realizing that many of the banks and other uh, and uh, petroleum companies and other fo folks that we were meant, you know, built up to be trusted over these years of them <clears throat> investing in our relationship and, our, and their brand. Um, have kind of failed us, and so that's, as entrepreneurs, I think a huge opportunity because it's created a big crack in the door for new brands, new services, new ideas to enter with less resistance. And then, of course, uh, we are, this is a historic moment because we are more connected to more people on the planet than ever before, uh, of, unless, of course, you're sitting next to them. But uh, mobile devices, social networks have brought us closer. And so if I look at um, what's the recipe or the cocktail for the share economy, why is this happening now? Well, it's essentially a lot of, from a technical at least perspective, these three things coming together. Uh, social networks and the ability for us to find each other very easily. Secondly, mobile devices that are getting increasingly so-called smart, small, and inexpensive, so they're increasingly pervasive. Uh, they're web-enabled and GPS-enabled, so they kind of allow us to find each other in things pretty easily and will be increasingly so. And third, the idea that physical goods, phys physical things can be found on the planet, whether they're things that move around like ourselves, boxes, moving through time and space, uh, cars and other forms of public transportation, or whether there are things that are meant to be stable, even in San Francisco, things like buildings and roads and bridges, uh, those things can, can now be found very easily. And so we become, the, the world becomes very navigable in a really new way, and I think that this has taken a lot of the friction out of sharing. In fact, I think we're at an inflection point in which the convenience and the cost of ownership is largely in question. One of the best examples we have today that I think many of you are probably familiar with is uh, uh, car sharing. And the largest car sharing company on the planet today is Zipcar. So Zipcar has done a lot of really smart things. Um, they, came, they didn't use ex-police cars, they came up with, you know, now we have minis and other sort of little cool cars that you can rent. They've made car sharing aspirational. I think their marketing has really contributed to that. And this is one of my favorite ads that they run about, uh, you know, 350 hours a year of sex and 420 looking for parking. Um, so that kind of speaks to one of the main uh, value propositions of their version of car sharing. But I don't think that that's the reason that Zipcar is winning, why that's the reason they're, they're strongest and biggest on the planet today. They understand that they're not in the transportation business. As a mesh company, they're really in the information business. Because when you buy a car, you have one instance with a dealer and you usually run away as quickly as possible. In a car sharing service or any other share-based business, um, 
think about Netflix, for example, or Spotify, Pandora, um, those kinds of services learn a lot about us. They have the privilege of learning about us as customers, and in exchange for that, the imperative, in my view, is to exchange a, a really incredible experience, and increasingly so. A friend of mine who was a card-carrying member of Zipcar uh, at the time, which is not so long ago, maybe five or six years ago, Shelby Clark, was living in the tropical climate of Cambridge, Massachusetts, going to Harvard, and he had a family event, and he went to uh, get a zip car, and the closest one that he could find was two miles away. So he got on the only other transportation he had, which is his bicycle, and he rode through this really freezing cold weather in a snowstorm uh, getting to the car. But on the way to getting to the car, not only was he increasingly frozen, but he was increasingly annoyed. And lucky for us, he was increasingly inspired because he passed parking lots that looked like this. Um, that's right, that in the US, in, what, in actually Western Europe and North America, to be more precise, 8% of the time we use our cars. The second most costly thing that most of us own sits around 92% of the time. And it's not only a cost to us, but we organize our cities around cars. One of the main principles of the mesh or the share economy is this that unused value, things that we value, whether we're, we're a business and it sits on our balance sheet or we're individuals and it just sits around our home, uh, things that we value like our cars or vacation homes, tools, talents, when they're being unused, they actually are in that moment waste. And so that brings us to what I refer to as uh, car sharing 2.0, which is borrow your neighbor's car. So since your neighbor's car is sitting around 92% of the time, rather than all of us owning cars, what if we borrowed each other's? And Car Sharing 2.0 launched first in uh, England with a company called Whipcar in 2010. And um, it took Whipcar, uh, it basically, the, the, um, the business of building base, of building an active membership base, for Zipcar, um, it took them six years to get a thousand cars act actively in service. It took it took Whipcar six months. So that's par partially because it's a very different business model, which we can address at some other moment or uh, perhaps in the Q and A here. But but also because peer to peer things, because they're peer to peer, can spread really quickly. One of the main principles of the mesh is this, that we're trading things, stuff, for really rich and powerful experiences. Um, and so we'll, we'll continue to discover what that might look like, and many of you are going to be familiar with some of these examples, but um, I believe that we're at the very beginning of this. So as an entrepreneur, I ask myself, you know, we're, we're, we're about making things consistent and scalable once we understand what the core value proposition is. So how do we make sharing irresistible? We certainly have instances in our life where sharing has been really irresistible, but how do we do that in a consistent and scalable way? Well, one of the ways is to start to look at uh, creating platforms, that platforms invite people to engage in new and different ways. Some examples of platforms that I'm sure many of you are familiar with is Kickstarter, which is essentially made kind of a micro Medici out of all of us, um, in inviting us to support projects with our wallets, uh, things that we actually want to see come forward in the world, whether they are community projects or products. Um, and these models, this uh, crowdfunding platform, is now in about 41 countries as of today, and there's over 100 platforms that are like this. And, and sorry, the like this is also the platform for the business is um, like Etsy or eBay, they take a, a small percentage, in this case 5%, of the successful projects that are funded. Um, GitHub is a, um, Git is, is a, 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 a term referred to, it's, a, it's actually a, 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 let's say a code base that's, um, that's a, a developer uh, system essentially, and the folks who started GitHub created um, this because they wanted to see collaboration go across teams of people who were building 
uh, ser services, products, code bases effectively around the world. You can see here on the ticker that it's it's uh, over a hundred and almost 1.8 million people uh, around the world who are who are sharing repositories, which what effectively is kind of a, an elaborate Dropbox or or space for them to actually park code. But also there's a, an, another really good example here of um, the culture of generosity where whether or not you're necessarily uh, benefiting financially from a code base, you or your team could actually contribute by reviewing it or, or tweaking it in some way that enables it to be more effective or giving some feedback in, in things that, um, that you're a beneficiary of in sort of in the long sense of, of the way of the word. Um, and so GitHub recently has raised $100 million from one of the more reputable and well-known firms, uh, Andreessen Horowitz in, in the Bay Area. But more than the money that they raised, GitHub is just a, a really elaborate and extremely successful platform for not only sharing, but, but creating um, uh, really interesting intellectual property and teams. Uh, and changing the culture, I think, of how software is developed. Um, cities, I also see as platforms, and we we know uh, that we've engaged with cities in a lot of different ways. You know, we've not been necessarily invited to create our voice or to represent our voice in in cities all the time, but we have. Um, and when I was in Copenhagen last year, there was a big bike race going on, and this was the logo. And one of the main things. Uh, that I love. I love this because it's, it represents uh, one of the big topics here, which is open. One of the main attributes of a platform, when we think about how we want to create a business or or a, a community or an ecosystem, is this notion of it being open, of, of allowing for an inviting engagement, and what that might look like. And so here is an example. San Francisco just launched a project called SF Better Streets that essentially um, is trying to circumvent the necessity for if you want to um, plant a tree in front of your house or create a little parklet someplace or you have an idea for a little pop-up festival in your neighborhood, allowing for people to be more um, creative and, and get a, a faster response by not having to go through all of the same bureaucracy for every sort of idea. And so it's, it's brought together five or six different departments of the city and created this platform that allows for us as, as residents of the city to be much more responsive and feel that we're, we are building a partnership together with the local government. Um, examples like this are happening all over the world. This is a company uh, that's, called, that's based here in San Francisco called Neighborland. Uh, what they did was actually discovered in New Orleans because they were basically trying to find ways that resorted it, something really low-tech, which is writing like this woman you see, farmer's market. It's what you want in your neighborhood. And just writing it on a little sticky that you wear or hold or something like that and having these kind of social events uh, when they were working in New Orleans to reinvent uh, what was going on there, this is a facility that they started to uh, discover was really effective, and so they've morphed that into an online service. Um, there's many examples, Pop-Up Hood, uh, Pop-Up City in Amsterdam, and many examples of, of these sorts of civic engagement communities that are emerging as well, showing that cities are platforms. Another big aspect of platforms and building communities is transparency. One example, especially when it comes to cities, uh, we see this as C-Click Fix based in New York. It's a company that uh, the guy who started it, Ben, was really annoyed because there was, uh, I believe it was a pothole in front of his house that he really wanted fixed. He spent over you know, three months on phone calls, in lines, frustrated, trying to get something really simple to happen. And so what this is, is you see something broken, a street light, a pothole, a sidewalk, you take a picture of it, the GPS tags the photo, you upload it through a service, it goes straight into the queue for the city to, to fix it rather than have to go through this whole silly process. And you get updates and status reports and saves the city a lot of money and turns out everybody's pretty happy. 
Um, a lot of what we've seen, and certainly uh, for those of us that have been paying attention to the way that marketing, marketing has been going in the last few years, essentially people don't listen to advertiser uh, stories anymore. That is, what a company says about itself is a lot less effective than what your friend says about the company. And so you start to see that your friends or your friends of friends or people that look like they might be someday your friend have a lot more influence and power with you than the company itself. And this has caused all of us, if we're uh, you know, running our own brands, but also certainly um, big, big businesses that are building their brands uh, and trying to navigate through this very different terrain, is how do they continue to have influence in an age when you know, advertising broadcast in the, in the real sense doesn't work anymore. Um, one of the things that, that where this comes together, where we start to see also the necessity for transparency and the, the reality of aligning what companies say about themselves with how they do their marketing outward, is this platform, change.org. And you may or may not be familiar with the story of Molly Catchpole, but essentially Bank of America um, added a $5 fee. Some of you may remember last year. Um, and uh, it was outraged. Everybody was outraged that they would do that for basically no good reason except more profits. Um, Molly got really annoyed, wrote a petition, um, got so much response that within three months period of time, uh, it was not only retracted but Bank of America apologized. Shortly thereafter, Verizon did uh, uh, the same sort of thing, slightly different fee, but the same sort of thing. Molly responded again. This time, it took less than a week to retract. So we're starting to see that you know, we as citizens have a lot of power, and the more transparency that a company has, the less apologies they need to make. Um, in, you know, since we're entrepreneurs, I thought I'd give you the harsh version of this one. So in the screw it, let's do it, you know, a lot of uh, what we've grown up with is perhaps um, trying to get something really right before launching, whereas now I think what we're uh, learning and what we're seeing is that getting out there and starting to do early prototyping and getting feedback is really key. And we're seeing this not only online, but this is uh, Darling Delicious is a store in Amsterdam <clears throat> that actually works with artisan uh, it's, um, kind of cosmetic manufacturers, but artisan makers who, uh, who really are enjoying creating these wonderful uh, products for health and beauty but um, they aren't necessarily sure how to price them, how to package them, uh, whether the smells are right, uh, if, the, if the target audience is right. And so Darling Delicious represents about, right now, about 45 different artisans. And they rotate the crop, essentially, and they rotate the products. But what they do is get people to come into their shop and try the products and give feedback. And that feedback goes back to the artisans. And there's many of these examples that <clears throat> some of them are happening in fashion, several of them in cosmetics, but, but also on the, the consumer, consumer product side as well. Um, I look to nature a lot to see where uh, there's this, the system kind of fits together and makes sense. And so in nature, we know that holes invite uh, new interesting things, that nature really abhors a vacuum. And so where there's a little hole, typically something pops up. Um, in this case, we see that there's these, there are these opportunities to d begin to define kind of pop-up offices or what's known as co-working spaces. They can be uh, dedicated co-working spaces like places like the hub or um, the various work lofts around, around the world. I mean, there's at this point tens of thousands of these uh, uh, popping up and actively in business. And they essentially use a gym membership model. So for example, I belong to uh, the hub in Berkeley and San Francisco and I pay a, a monthly fee to just have access to the, to the office and if I want other things, uh, a, a, a half day of conference room or something like that, for example, uh, then I get charged a la carte. So it's really the model of you pay for what you want, when you want it, where you want it, and um, you pay just for what you use, not for the waste. Um, Loose Cubes is actually an international network of co-working spaces, dedicated co-working spaces, but also if I have an office 
and I'm, I have 30 desks, but I'm only using 10 uh, during the summer, that I can actually put my 20 loose cubes up on this network and invite people to either come in and pay a weekly or daily rate, or simply say, hey, anybody that has uh, speaks fluent Italian and has uh, UX or, or agile programming background, you're, you're free to come and hang out. We just want you to riff with us once in a while. And so it's also really creating this culture, global culture, that will really change the economics of how we build companies and also how we scale them. So in a springboard for thinking about what, what's, our, what's our next steps from an action point of view, um, one of the big things that, that I pay a lot of attention to is, is mistakes, um, because I think that mistakes are really informative. Um, this, is a, this is a photo of the early version of what had become the LEAP, which is uh, the, now known as the Paris Bike Sharing Service. But initially, in 2005, the LEAP launched in Lyon, in the second largest city of France. Um, they launched a smaller program there, they learned a lot, they tweaked it, they got a lot of feedback, they re, 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 sort of refined their relationship with their partner and relaunched in Paris two years later. Now, uh, in more than 300 cities around the world, bike sharing has become the fastest growing form of personal transportation on the planet. And so we all have benefited from the mistakes that uh, were made in Lyon and Paris and other bike sharing experiments since then. The systems have be, been redefined, the, the partnerships, the actual bicycles, the technologies, uh, all made to fit the culture that they were going into as well as really taking into consideration all the lessons that have come before. And we, the next each city doesn't then have to pay a newly in time and money. So in the business of you know, leveraging scar tissue, somebody already learned that lesson, so let's take that lesson and multiply it. There are platform examples as well, beyond the physical like bike sharing, which is um, CrowdTest, and this is one that allows for software developers. These are, uh, this is a company based in Brazil, but they basically have professionals who are dedicated to breaking stuff, and they're really good at it, and not only do they uh, break your system before you launch it, or, or try to find ways that it's it's already broken, but not you know not functioning super well. Um, they also come back with a lot of really interesting examples about new products or ways to make two or three products out of the one that you thought you had as one alone. Um, this isn't me when uh, a, a few years ago I, I'm. Uh, this was one of our Ophoto kids. Um, so when we when we launched Ophoto, this is just a reminder for me to share with you that one of the big things that's changing in the world today is the whole need for uh, capital. For example, uh, in 1999 when we started Ophoto, we raised just under 60 million dollars from venture capitalists and. Uh, there was about six other companies, actually seven other companies at the same time who were, you know, within a year's period raised about the same amount of money doing more or less the same sort of business. So when I was starting to write the book and really look at this uh, phenomenon and realizing that all of these people, teams being distributed, all of these platforms, these SaaS services, these distributed physical services like hosting and uh, printing and fulfillment services, the whole, our whole value chain could now be outsourced. And so I took the proposal that we had created in 99 with my CFO and we sat down in uh, 2008 and redid it, looking at how we would launch then. Um, and we actually came up with, it was slightly less than $3 million of the $60 million that had been you know, needed to raise uh, less than 10 years previous. So the need for capital and the way that we are designing companies, products, and going to market is changing radically and really rapidly. Um, in the business, I, I refer to, and people who have worked with me are probably sick of me saying this, but this define, refine, and scale, that we 
uh, define a product or an idea, refine it by putting it out there, getting feedback, being really responsive and listening, and continuing to refine it. It's a very iterative process. And the real trick here, and the real goodness, I think, is that um, in the old days, the tendency was to find, refine, and scale straight away without any stopping. And so there was a ton of money for big companies and startups uh, that, that got completely wasted, as, uh, as well as brand value and other things, by scaling prematurely. And so these platforms allow us to scale in, very mi in, in terms of geographically micro-markets, as well as being able to use the platforms to really refine the business model, the approach, the experience, and then scale it. It's so much more effective. Um, third, the, the, the big, one of the big, big opportunities here is data. And looking at ways to use data to um, create partnerships, to use data with um, cities to, to essentially increase our peripheral vision beyond what we can see in our own customer space. And so here's an example with London Data Store. It's one of the most prolific uh, city libraries that created basically an open data library. And you can go here and uh, discover traffic, crime, real estate data, uh, uh, transit data, all sorts of things that would allow you to, to see patterns and maybe make thoughtful investments or build interesting applications. This is just a quick example of something that is an infographic that gets uh, built from the data that, that exists at the London Data Store. Obviously, it's just a, a, a quick example for you. And then looking at nature again, um, waste equals food, a well-known moniker in ecology, which is essentially to say that um, the, the waste from one system becomes food for the next. And so when nature or we are in balance, there is no waste. Some examples um, when we start to see thoughtful things uh, companies are doing, uh, both in the physical and the, and the sort of virtual worlds, this is... Um, this is Electrolux, which is based in Sweden. Obviously, or not surprisingly, many of their customers are women. When they surveyed uh, what women were concerned about most was the health of the environment, specifically the ocean. So they came up with this idea to essentially uh, form partnerships with a couple of not-for-profits, uh, engage local communities to collect plastic from the ocean, and then use that plastic to create a limited edition series of a product. So they created, um, not trying to hide where the plastic came from, they created what I think these are really stunning uh, limited edition series vacuum cleaners that are back of the sea, and that these were sold out really rapidly, but also uh, created a lot of brand equity and a lot of um, interesting, in, interesting questions inside of the Electrolux company about how they engage with their community and build products going forward. Serendipity, because of all of the tools that we have, um, isn't just us randomly bumping up against each other or into each other. Now we can actually engineer ser serendipity, and uh, Training Mobs is an example of that. Some of you might be uh, familiar with RunKeeper also, but essentially um, you can say, hey, I'm traveling, I happen to be here, you spark up one of these applications and discover other people near you who are ready to do a little workout. So it creates a, a kind of healthy mob. Um, collaborative innovation, we know that this is the underbelly of a lot of this um, once we get going. Kaggle is a company that is um, making challenges, so taking uh, data that might be, for example, health data, and it will say uh, from a from a big uh, healthcare company or from a company like GE, um, we have a lot of data. We, we're not sure that we can find the right kinds of patterns. We have three or four big questions. So Kaggle organizes with data jockeys all over the world, people who are real studs with data. They create these competitions and bring the, the challenge forward and get really interesting uh, resolutions from, the, from what was formerly the waste of the data, they get a lot of value in creating these sorts of intersections. And then one of my uh, favorite groups of, of people working in data is the Open Knowledge Foundation, and they're 
basically just as they say, or as their name says, they're actually organizing a lot of open spaces for data camps and data events, especially with governments around the world. Another quick example in New York and Brooklyn, uh, there was a group of people who launched something called Trade School. It was essentially a barter, um, I know how to farm, uh, you know, uh, urban farm, I have raised beds, I know how to do these sorts of things, um, but I always wanted to play guitar. And so basically I would give a class on photography or on urban farming and I could attend a, a number of other classes that other folks have been giving. It was so successful that they just now raised a bunch of money on Kickstarter to scale uh, what they were doing and through building a platform. So we're seeing this pattern very frequently where, again, somebody's defining and refining in a local market and then scaling in interesting ways. Um, this is a great example of an open source solution to something that um, many have been solving in other ways for many years. Um, Wikispeed is was an attempt to build a, a um, product, or a prototype at least, that would win an X prize. Um, they built, there, there was a gentleman who had an idea, why can't we build a car that could go 100 miles an hour that would cost $20,000 or less and be a commuter car, um, and why can't we build it open source? He put it out there, 44 people from around the world came together to design a car in 30 days, and sorry, in three months versus what is typically three to five years. So um, Wikispeed is right now attempting to, to finish collecting the money that they need to go ahead and start to put their car into production. So there's many, many examples. We're at the very beginning of something, and this is really shaping and reshaping the way that we think about markets, relationships, building companies, communities, uh, products, our environment, um, and, and lifestyle and happiness. It's, it's bringing a lot of things into question. And I think that more and more sectors are, are experimenting um, in playing games, uh, trying new kinds of partnerships, reaching new and interesting markets. And I would, I would invite each and every one of you to begin to blow things up, to try small experiments, and to begin to define, refine, and scale. And so um, in closing with uh, a thought from one of my favorite science fiction authors, William Gibson, um, the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. That a lot of this is about the rethinking, redistribution, and reconnecting of ideas, communities, and products. Thank you very much. Um, just a quick reminder, if you have questions you want to explore or you want to add co your companies or programs to the MESH directory, here's a quick reminder. Uh, we can happy, happily talk at some point about the Instigator Collective, which is just being getting ready to be launched in the fall. And lastly, I just wanted to thank you very much for your patience, and I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Lisa, thank you very much. Um, it turns out, for some reason, we're having a bit of an echo, so I'm going to enter the questions to you directly in the chat section of your screen. Um, we, okay. do, we do have a first question, which is, can you refine scale better? So is refine scale the essence of innovation? Sorry, is refine, is, there's two questions. Can we do it better, or is the question, um, is it the essence of innovation? Is it the essence of innovation? I think the refined scale is the essence of a, a successful go-to-market. I often think about, a lot of times, the scaling. So innovation is a, what I refer to as a tofu word. It, it can be applied to almost anything. It takes on the taste of what's around it. Um, and so I think that um, going from refine to scale, the, it, that itself could be the innovation. You could innovate in the way that you, that you move to scale something. Um, and so, for example, uh, the, with the trade school example, <clears throat> they, they came up with an innovative way to scale after they refined their model in the local market of Brooklyn. Um, but there are many other ways to innovate that could be just the actual definition of the product. 
the innovation could be in a partnership of realizing that you know your chocolate and my peanut butter kind of thing wow if we put you know your community or my team and your technology together we could rapidly do this and that for somebody else um, or do it in a unique way and so the innovation I think could be applied to to many things um, maybe the the person asking the question had something more specific in mind but um, that's that's my interpretation based on what what I what you had told me so far that's great a couple more questions uh, the first one is, sharing based businesses are the new middleman for services and products. How do such businesses survive in the face of consumers thinking they can save money by cutting out the middleman? Huh. Um, so I, I think that sharing based businesses aren't necessarily the middleman. Um, uh, maybe, well, there's a couple examples. So one is, um, I don't know what the what the person asking the question might be alluding to, but for example, Airbnb or Relay Rides or TaskRabbit, those um, those are examples. So, and respectively, Airbnb is a uh, a platform that allows me to rent uh, your apartment or vacation rental uh, or a room in your home. Um, Relay Rides allows me to rent your car or uh, and then the third example was TaskRabbit, which allows me to, um, if I'm, I'm throwing a party and I'm running out of time, I can hire local people who are running, helping me run errands or do a variety of tasks, potentially helping to serve at the party. I can even hire chefs and all sorts of things. So it's really b between um, logistics and talent, really experienced talent in local markets. And I don't know, maybe what are you alluding to the idea that once I do, once I know that my neighbor's car is available, I, I can go around relay rides and go straight to the neighbor? Um, because I, I think that for the most part, um, the platforms have been bringing together people and uh, they actually are in the same way that you think about Spotify or uh, Pandora, Netflix, bringing you ideas and a bigger inventory than you would otherwise have and a bigger sort of awareness of what you would otherwise have or be open to, a lot of these platforms are designed to do that so that, you know, you may not know, like you might use your neighbor's mini and think that's great for most of the time, but then you don't have a car and, you, you know, it turns out that somebody around the corner that you don't know has the perfect pickup truck for your weekend of garden activities, you know, and so the the idea, I think, um, if you're if you're alluding to the idea that somebody would circumvent the platform once they had the connections in place, um, I haven't seen that as a consequence. I think that in general, people feel that they are um, these are these are methods that are uh, pretty inexpensive, and that you're actually paying for what you use anyway. So it's more being related to the cost of ownership. Wow, I, it cost me. Um, eight thousand dollars a year to own a car and if roughly I'm even if I'm using it 20 percent of the time um, you know it's 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 essentially still sixty eight hundred dollars that's going to waste even if I'm just looking at the money part of it and so most people I think are comparing um, this this uh, access kind of model to ownership so the difference between putting a gym in your house or having a gym membership, um, th that sort of thing. I hope I'm answering your question. Lisa, the, the next question is that sharing takes a certain amount of want to among the parties. Will the participants be those already technically savvy or a certain demographic, or will this be forced upon all of us because of other global external actors? I think forced might be a strong word. Um, but I think that what the, there will certainly be a premium paid for ownership, um, and I think that in fact there already is. Uh, and so, and so I would just say that um, I think that what what will happen is increasingly more and more uh, sharing models will emerge, and they'll become increasingly compelling. You know, there's it, there's ways for 
for example, um, here in Napa, where I live, you know, I'm I, um, I'm interested in creating a kind of um, a tech shop for kit for kitchens, where we can have you know a, a very well equipped community kitchen. You know, it's a it's essentially like a gym membership, and um, there's a lot of really talented people here that I'd love to learn from, and there's a lot of um, things that we grow and make and do that are very seasonal, that are easier and more fun to do when they're in a group, whether it's, you know, harvesting grapes, the classic one here certainly, or, you know, things like canning, making lemon limoncello and lemon curd, and it, it tends to be very seasonal. And so I think increasingly um, people will, like, it, I look at it from a marketing perspective as it's very similar to any other moment in time when the, the onus is on us as entrepreneurs to, to create something that's more compelling than, um, than the alternative. And so if you, you know, if you fail to create a model, it's, so to, and you're asking it from the consumer perspective, which is, I think if you really want your own car or you want your vacation home and no one else to use it, of course that's your prerogative. Um, but but I think that increasingly because we have, you know, the population is going towards where it is and the cities are going to look the way they, they're apparently going to, that um, space is at a premium and many things are going to come at a premium. And so if you're willing to pay the premium because it's worth it to you, then certainly it's not forced. But I think that the models are going to be um, sliced and diced and continue to be refined in ways that uh, hopefully, the the amount of service and and coolness, other other things that you get um, as a function of sharing, is is going to um, continue to to make it actually more attractive than ownership. And I think that that's really true, and we're starting to see that already. That people feel uh, like, for example, a company called ThreadUp, that's kind of Netflix for kids' clothing reports that people feel just really relieved when they can take these expensive clothes that they bought that their kid barely used and give them to somebody else who's going to be, you know, really appreciating them at just the right time and at the same time receive great clothes from somebody else. And it's, and they're using, it's a great example of, you know, using the algorithms and the technology to make the matching in a very temporal um, scenario because if you don't happen to know if your kid isn't exactly the size of this perfectly matched to the friend, then then the, the, the exchange between you and an informal friendship doesn't work anymore. Lisa, one more question. That's great. That's very helpful. Can you, uh, last question would be, what is your vision for the Instigator Collective? Ah, well, the Instigator Collective is simple for me. I, um, I'm like a little, I feel I'm pretty immature and I really enjoy um, being connected to people who like to start trouble. And um, in the last three or four years, I've been traveling a lot and being uh, involved with projects around the world in a, to about 14 countries and meeting with lots of different people, entrepreneurs, um, people who are heading community projects and local governments and all sorts of folks who want to do something, but because I didn't really have the capacity to uh, support them, even with the team here, um, we, I realized that's really silly. We should turn the model upside down. And so bring together the idea is essentially that there's instigators all over the world and we would benefit from from sharing with each other, from seeing what works in, in one place and another, um, tools that we, everything from tools that we might have that are, might be very simple to excess team to, um, you know, new ways to think about scaling ideas. Um, but essentially we would have an online, so we're building an online hub. And then um, my hope is that we would have one or two global events where we bring people together and we can get kind of connected to each other to have a, um, a you know, a, a network of characters that we can hang out with and, and cook up uh, cool ideas, but also have to, as colleagues and allies that, that support us making a difference in our communities. Um, this is, a, this is something that has a place, you know, it's, it's, um, we, we are where we live for the most part. 
And even though we're connected by all of these really cool technologies globally, in the end, a lot of our life and the quality of our life is a function of where we live. And I think a lot of us are trying to make that um, different and better. And so I, I felt like it would be really wonderful to bring all of us who are trying to do that together. Lisa, thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank you, and I want to thank all of our participants for joining us. Your, the information you've shared has been so helpful, and I think uh, is going to help all of us think a little bit differently. For those of you who joined us today, thank you so much for taking your time. I want to invite all of you to attend our next author series event. It will be held on September 12th, and we'll feature Alicia Robb, who's a senior fellow at the Kauffman Foundation. Alicia recently uh, published a book called A Rising Tide, Financing Strategies for Women-Owned Firms. It's been very helpful to us here at Kauffman Fast Track, and I think it'll be helpful to all of you as well. Everyone have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye-bye.